Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics Career Choice Panel Discussion. We are very excited to have our panelists and participants with us today. To get things started, we'd like to know how you're joining with us. Please let us know if you are joining, joining us as an individual attendee, which is viewing on your device, or if you're participating in a class via the poll on your screen. And I'll just give you a few minutes if, uh, to respond to that. Okay, so it looks like we've got 93% are attending individually and 7% is attending through a class. So however you're joining us today, we hope you'll actively participate in the discussion. While you cannot chat with our panelists via the chat feature, you can and are encouraged to submit your questions for the panel or a particular panelist via the Q&A feature. Submit your name or class name with your question and we'll read it along with your submission or feel free to, to submit a, a question anonymously. There will also be a couple of polling questions just like the one we completed just a minute ago. So please submit your answers promptly to have your responses recorded. Now, without further delay, I'd like to turn things over to the panel's moderator, Dr. Tammy Herb, which is with GoTech and the Institute of Advanced Learning and Research. Thank you, Sherry. And good afternoon, everyone, and welcome again to our Career Choice Panel Discussion Session 4. Uh, that's Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. This is the STEM group. Our panelists today are going to be Richie Barker with Harlow Fast Tech, Dr. Scott uh, Lohman with the Institute for Advanced Learning and Research, Leslie Mantiqua with Dewberry, and Kimberly Moore with Dan Chemical. I'm going to take them a moment to invite each panelist, starting with um, Mr. Barker, uh, to introduce himself and give us a little bit of background about where he's coming from and what it is that he does. Hi, good after, afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Richie Barker. I work for Fast Tech LLC. Uh, I'm the Chief Operating Officer. Uh, I'm not a local Danvillian. Uh, I'm originally from, the, from Scotland in the United Kingdom. Uh, I've been in the US for over three years now since we started the business. So Fastec are an additive and subtractive manufacturing company. We grow parts out of metal uh, and then we mach precision machine them to their final state. Uh, you'll see some pictures there, some great pictures there of our equipment. We, uh, we have some high precision five axis machining equipment and we as you see the top left hand corner is the largest metal 3d printer in the us the first of its kind uh, which is located here in the uh, in danville uh, uh, slayton avenue just behind the institute uh, so it can print three and a half feet by three and a half feet and up to nearly a thousand pounds in weight and multiple different types of materials so uh, we're, we're quite an advanced company and what we do is state of the art. Uh, it's all a uh, new technology, which is quite scary as well to, to be a business, a business leader using something that people haven't adopted fully yet. So for me, you know, day to day, it's growing and developing a new, a relatively new business, which is only three years old since we started it in 2018. Uh, I look after the day-to-day -day operations, uh, the technical side of the business, and uh, support sales as necessary. So uh, I've been with the organization since it started. Uh, I'm a, a, one of, th one of the, the, the shareholders in the business as well, uh, and look after, the, uh, look after the growth and development of our new employees as well. So, uh, my background comes from oil and gas originally. Uh, I was 15 years in a multi-billion dollar organization before I decided that Danville was the place I wanted to be. Uh, and that is 
the, that is a true statement. I was in a very, very successful role within a large organization and seeing the vision of the Institute and the region uh, and the people leading Danville it actually made me decide to leave that secure uh, hub and, and bring my family across to Danville. So uh, kudos to the, 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 the team here and look, at, look where we are today with everything going on. So when I first started in industry, uh, I was in automotive repair, uh, which was uh, something I hadn't planned to go into. It was a stopgap waiting for a uh, position in uh, manufacturing and mechanical engineering. Uh, but it gave me the, the, the start I needed and the, the kickstart to actually understand what it meant to actually be in a job. So, uh, but it's, it was just a, a completely different uh, to where I am today. Uh, favorite part about my job and what I currently do is bringing new people into our business, uh, growing and advancing the skills of our employees uh, and getting to play with some really cool toys as well while we're doing it. So that's, that's me and that's what we do. Okay, uh, my name is Dr. Scott Lohman, and I am Director of Research at the Institute for Advanced Learning Research. Um, I have been here for about, since about 2009, I actually earned my PhD here through Virginia Tech, and I've uh, worked my way up through scientist and chief scientist and now Director of Research. Um, what I do every day, I, uh, we have, our, our main goal is to use biology and technology to improve agricultural production, but while doing that, we also work with industry and we address industry needs. We participate in workforce training. Um, I write a lot of grants. Uh, 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 you know, fill out paperwork a lot of times. That's that's not the, really the glorious part. Uh, but part of our program is focused on developing uh, biostimulants and biocontrol agents, or, or in other words, natural ways to increase uh, plant growth. We also have a robotics program where we. Uh, use a robot to monitor plant growth almost by the minute. And then on the backside, we use coding like Python and C++ to analyze those images and run the tables. Um, we also have a, a analytical chemistry department where we can test products from farmers and from industry for safety and efficacy. And then we also have a polymer program where we can look at plastics and how to help really local industry that are in the plastics business. Um, my typical work day, I come in and uh, first of all, we check on the, the status of all of our research experiments. We, uh, we, look, at, we look over SOPs. Um, we I meet with different research staff. We have plant pathologists on staff. We have a plant physiologist on staff. We have robotics people. We have people that fly drones and as well as uh, people that work in the controlled environment agriculture area. And that's something I should talk more about. We recently launched a initiative with Virginia Tech where we look at plants that are grown indoors year-round. And in fact, we're fortunate to have a new company located to the region called Aero Farms, and they're building the world's largest indoor production facility right up the road. They'll be growing about 2.3 million pounds of lettuce every growing season. Um, let's see, uh, to, to get this position, I have to have a PhD, uh, but I earned my master's at the College of William & Mary and molecular biology. And then my PhD work was here at the Institute through Virginia Tech, as I mentioned earlier, and that's focused, but also on molecular biology, but, but also plant microbe interactions. I spent, after earning my master's degree, I spent about eight years in the pharmaceutical industry, working as a sales and marketing rep. And that was very beneficial for me. And in fact, uh, one of the questions on here is what was my first job ever? Um, that was very different than the pharmaceutical industry. That was actually weed eating for the town of Alta Vista. <laughs> uh, and I kind of missed those days. That was a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun at the same time. Um, so I have not always worked in the field. And I also, at a different time in my life, prior to earning my PhD, I co-founded an urban farm where we work with people with disabilities to grow vegetables for the, uh, for the people surrounding Lynchburg. And we have 150 members that pay $20 per week to get their vegetables from us. And now that, that organization is called Lynchburg Rose and it's 20 years old. Um, the favorite part about my current job is, is when I come in every day, it's something different. 
I love to, to tinker. So the smart tables that are uh, shown there, I love to come in and uh, make adjustments on it and, and uh, improve the tables and also run the experiments on the tables. And with that, I'll wrap it up and uh, look forward to the rest of the panelists' introductions. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Leslie, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi everyone, my name is Leslie Mantify and I am a civil engineer with a focus in water. Um, I am a 2014 Virginia Tech graduate and I have been here at Dewberry since I graduated uh, seven years ago. So what we do, our first of this slide, one of my favorite parts about working for Dewberry is our culture. And you can see our core values that we have at Dewberry. And that has been something that has made me feel very at home with Dewberry. Um, we are in consulting, so we serve communities. Um, so for example, the city of Danville or Pennsylvania County, Halifax County, those are all communities that we work for. So what I do um, is, since I'm a focus in water, we figure out how water gets from a river or a lake, how it gets treated, and then how it gets distributed so that we can turn on our faucet and drink the water. And then when the water goes down the drain, whether you flush a toilet or you take a shower, how we treat the water again before going back into our rivers and streams. So we develop the design for all of those systems. Um, so the cool thing about Dewberry that I enjoy a lot is we are a very large company. We are nationwide. We have over 50 locations. So I focus here in Danville. However, I get to work on projects all over the country as well. So um, it's really nice to have our core group here in Danville, but also be able to have expertise from all over the country and learn from people um, that are in different communities than where we live. So here locally in Danville, we um, actually do have four core services. Uh, the first is survey. So think going out and getting the elevations, um, topographic information so that we can then develop our design documents. The next is engineering, so that's where I am focused, and that picture is actually of a wastewater treatment plant in Halifax, that's um, on Maple Avenue, if any of you are familiar. Uh, the next is architecture, and you'll recognize that photo, that is the institute. Um, Dewberry did the architecture for uh, that building and for most of the buildings in the cyber park. Uh, that's a big practice here in Danville. And then our last service is environmental science. So we do anything from stream restoration, uh, wetland delineation, how we can protect our environment um, during construction and with our designs. Um, so as I mentioned, this has been my first job. I've been here seven years and I thoroughly enjoy it. Um, I'm from Pittsburgh originally and Danville has become home for me. And there's so much opportunity uh, to live and to thrive and to be involved here. So. Um, looking forward to sharing more with you today. Thank you, Leslie. Kimberly, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and what it is you do? Hello, everyone. My name is Kimberly Moore. I work at Dan Kim as an engineer. Um, I've been with the organization for two years now. Um, and as an engineer here, um, Dan Kim is a contract manufacturing facility. And what that means is that we work with various customers in making their products um, at our very, in our various plants. Uh, we have two dedicated plants um, for specific customers, and then we have a multi-purpose plant. And that's the plant that I work in and that we make different products for a number of different customers. Um, so a typical day for me is like every morning we have a morning meeting to kind of get an update of how things are going in the plant, what products are made and, and how they are coming along. Um, we have core, what we consider core products are basically products that we've made over several years and that we have a good understanding of how they work. And myself, along with other engineers that work um, here at Dan Kim, we're responsible for those products on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, what we also have are uh, new products that come in when we get to work with new customers and we get to what we call pilot those um, products on a smaller scale. 
and that we also can scale up to a much larger scale in our MPP or multi-purpose plant facility. And then the third portion of my job is also working on special pro um, projects. Um, if we need to install a new piece of equipment or we need to expand um, what we're currently doing um, or expand a new packaging process, um, we get to work on those projects as well. Um, prior to Dan Cam, I worked um, at Dow Corning Silicones um, in Michigan. And I did uh, similar um, roles, uh, process and quality engineering at, at that um, company. Um, I received my uh, bachelor's and master's degree in chemical engineering from North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, and uh, the best part of my job, I feel, is I love working um, on the new products that come in um, to the plant and get to see how they're made and um, how we can potentially grow and expand um, different um, customers' needs. Um, my first ever job was working at a grocery store as a cashier. So um, that's a little bit about what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. I, I like what I'm doing because if you work in a manufacturing facility, um, each day brings something new. You're never doing the same thing over and over again. You never know when you need to perhaps try to have to troubleshoot um, a piece of equipment or if a product is not acting the way that it normally is supposed to act, um, figuring out um, what's going on. So in a lot of ways, engineering is just, and we're just basically problem solvers. And that's something um, that I just enjoy doing. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Uh, we are going to start taking a look at some questions. Um, looking to see if we have any here from our students. I believe they're going to launch a poll for our students to take. But in the meantime, um, let's start with this question. I'll go around to each one of you. What is one of the biggest challenges of your work? Kimberly, we'll start with you this time. Sure. Um... Um, as I stated earlier, we, um, we make products for customers. So when, we, when a customer comes to us and they want us to make their product, uh, one of the biggest challenges is using our current equipment and um, processing capabilities to see if we're able to actually make that product. And if not, what we can do in order to make that product, whether we have a uh, equipment modification or we have to bring in a new piece of equipment or what changes that we have to do to our current equipment so that we're able to make that product. So um, that um, is one of the biggest challenges um, that I, I face um, in my daily work. Leslie, how about you? One of the biggest challenges um, in the design side of water and wastewater treatment is uh, changes in regulatory requirements, kind of projecting what um, requirements might look like in five to 10 years for um, our communities so that we're updating um, our treatment facilities to meet those future regulations. So um, that's staying on top of research, um, staying on top of uh, what the EPA is looking at and where they might be going. So. Um, just always staying curious as to what's coming next uh, when it comes to regulations. It's definitely a challenge. I can imagine. Scott? My biggest challenge is keeping organized and keeping on top of what everybody's doing. We have seven scientists working here, including two more from Virginia Tech, and everybody has different projects. Now, a lot of times we work with industry uh, for contract research, and every industry that comes to us has a different need. Um, they have a different uh, set of skills that are required for their contract research programs, usually a different plant. Uh, so we can go from working with corn or soybean to, to, to cucumber, to strawberries or tomatoes, even lettuce indoors. Every plant's different and people don't realize that how, how I think how complicated plants are. They can behave differently. Um, even plants of the same cultivar like different tomatoes, whether it's a tall red vine or a dwarf tomato, they can all behave differently. And until you really do the work, you, you don't know exactly what to expect. 
So my biggest challenge, again, is just is staying on top of working with a chemist and a robotics person and plant science and polymers and, and others. That, uh, that really takes a lot of brain width. So that doesn't leave me a lot of time to, to do the paperwork I need to be doing more often. So that's, that's my biggest challenge. Okay, Richie? Well, yeah, my biggest challenge is uh, trying to uh, preach our technology to industry, you know, because it is a new technology and an advanced, uh, you know, uh, advanced process. People haven't adopted it yet, or a lot, of, a lot of industries haven't adopted it yet. So trying to take something that somebody's never used and put it into a production environment or into a a critical environment like aerospace uh, or energy, where you're dealing with uh, you know people's you know people's lives, uh, it, it, it's it's a very taxing and uh, difficult uh, pitch to a lot of customers. But we're finding now that because of COVID, especially, we've we've had a lot of people changing their mindsets. And looking to try and advance and develop new technologies. How can we make it easier, quicker, safer, uh, you know, more environmentally friendly, uh, with less waste? So it's that that I'm like Scott. You know, we, we we you spend most of your day doing this, and then trying to keep up with the day to day things. Uh, it does make it very challenging. But I wouldn't have it any other way. I completely agree. Uh, we had a specific question asking about how many different types of engineering there are. For example, uh, aerospace, aerospace engineering, chemical engineering. Um, what types of engineering um, do you all specifically work with? Leslie, you want to start? Sure. I'll start by just sharing um, in my field what types we, are, we touch with our design. So we have structural engineers electrical engineers, mechanical, um, plumbing, fire protection, uh, land development, geotechnical, um, oh goodness, we have ocean engineers. Um, so Justin, oh, even transportation as well. That's another big field that we touch as well. So there are many, many more, but that's uh, in my world what we focus in. Scott, how about you? What type of engineering do you do you work with? Our program is pretty cool in that we work a lot with mechanical engineers to help design and build our robots, uh, but we also work with biological engineers, biological systems engineers. Um, as we we like to take we part of what we do with their biostimulants and biocontrols is that we we have to grow up a bunch of them to to, uh, to, to be able to apply those to plants. And the cool thing about bacteria, it's pretty easy to grow bacteria. Uh, we can start off with one single bacterium at night and eight hours later have billions of that bacteria. They keep, continue to multiply and divide exponentially. So bio, biosystems engineering, uh, lighting engineers we work with in the CEA center. Uh, and that's, that's, those are the primary groups that we work with. Kimberly, how about in your career? In my career, um, uh, we mainly work with uh, chemical engineers, uh, mechanical engineers, um, electrical engineers, and environmental engineers. Um, and those all are at our manufacturing facility here. Richie? Yeah, we mechanical engineering, weld engineering, uh, finite analysis engineers, uh, aerospace, energy, uh, oil and gas, uh, subsea specifically, most of that is uh, in the mechanical field. But yeah, we'd, we'd be touching a, a, a massive range of different uh, skill sets and engineering types on a daily basis. Scott, I'm going to direct this question to you. Neil would like to know if chemical engineering uses more organic chemistry or in a, inorganic chemistry. <laughs> uh, well, um, it depends on what type of chemical engineering you're, you're going to be doing, right? Um, so a lot, of, a lot in, in agriculture and what I do is organic-based chemistry. Um, but our analytical chemist is, is skilled in, in, in basic analytical chemistry. So uh, that's a terrific question, Neil. And, um, and I'm probably not the best person. I think Kimberly may be better to answer that than me. <laughs> 
Kimberly? Um, actually, the cool thing about chemical engineering is you can go either route. Um, um, to get your um, degree, you do have to take both organic and inorganic classes. So you do um, learn about both and whatever really interests you, um, you can take it from there. But um, in my career, I mainly work um, with organic chemicals, but we also have processes here um, that uses organic um, chemistry as well. So it just all depends on your interest level and, and what you like to do. Well, Kimberly, I'll tell you, we'll, we'll go straight into the next question and start with you. Um, Orion would like to know what training prepared you for your career and if there are classes that you would recommend for high school students. Okay. Um, for high school students, um, if you already know the discipline of engineering that you would like to go into, it would be great to see if your school um, has classes related to those. Um, I took advanced placement chemistry when I was in high school um, and that greatly helped me um, decide that chemical engineering was for me. Um, as you get into college, I would strongly suggest um, you do an internship or co-op program at, um, at a, 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 at a company um, that, that on that, experience really helps you set whether or not you want to do this or not. And it's, it's very invaluable. Um, so definitely take those classes and advance because in college, you'll have to take calculus and um, physics and all that good stuff. So in high school, if you can take those um, science and math courses um, to kind of get a grasp on on those before you enter college. And while in college, um, they uh, definitely try to get internships during the summer or co-ops during the semester um, in the fields that you are interested in. Um, that would definitely be beneficial as to decide which discipline of engineering you would like to go into. Richie, same question. For our, our industry, you would look at either a, a welding or metallurgy uh, or again because of the different complex areas of our business we've got uh, a great program that we've got here in Danville the precision machining program uh, first second and third year uh, that would certainly give a, anyone a, a, a footholding into our organization uh, but from the on the additive side uh, it's more on either the robotics or on, as I say, welding or metallurgy. Okay. The internship, you know, for us, we've been, you know, uh, uh, it's great that Kimberly mentioned the internships. You know, we've been bringing uh, young adults through the, uh, who are on the second and third year program from the precision machining program, bringing them into our organization to allow them hours to develop their skills instead of just learning in that classroom environment, uh, to actually touch and feel uh, the, the products and put, put their skills into a real life uh, scenario. Okay. Leslie, what course did you take in high school that was the hardest? I'd say the hardest and also the course that prepared me the most for college was AP Calculus. If you can take calculus in high school, it will prepare you for an engineering program um, in your secondary education if you choose to do so. Great advice. Scott, how about you? What was your hardest? What, what, what training prepared you most? And then what was your hardest class that you took? Um, well, both biology and chemistry in high school were very important for me. And as Leslie said, calculus is, you know, if you can get into an advanced placement calculus and get those credits up front, which is always great too, right? Um, but that prepares you best for, for an engineering type degree for sure. And that was the most difficult and challenging for me. Okay. Um, according to the last poll that was taken, students really wanna know what hobbies you all have outside of work. Leslie, let's start with you. Sure, um, I am a yoga instructor on the side. So I love yoga and I love fitness. I also, I'm a member at a CrossFit gym. So 
<laughs> well, I'm not doing one of those two. You can usually see me walking my dog. Um, so I, I like to get outside as much as I can uh, outside of work. Kimberly? Um, so outside of work, um, I like to um, go to diff different um, concerts and musical events and theater. I'm not that gifted in arts, but I love to go to painting classes and do those types of things. And so that's, that's some of the things I like to do um, just to kind of get my mind on something different than what I do every day at work. Scott, how about you? <clears throat> my wife would say I have too many hobbies. Um, I, I like restoration. So uh, anything mechanical, uh, even since I, at high school, I enjoyed working on engines, so which you wouldn't necessarily think of a scientist uh, doing, but um, I just restored a, a go-kart from 1967. I'm working on a 72 Corvette, and my biggest project in my life, I'm restoring a 37-foot cruiser on Smith Mountain Lake that's got two engines and a uh, big gigantic thing. It's all, it's all aluminum, so it's a really cool boat, but, uh, but restoration is really my, my hobby. Richie, tell us about your hobbies outside of work. My hobby outside of work is my family. Uh, I, spe I spend so much time at work. Uh, I focus as much time just doing outdoor things with them, just trying to just have great family time. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's important that we, we can bond and do things together. We try to do as much as we can. Uh, and vacation when I can, that is a, a great hobby I enjoy the most but don't get to practice as much as I should. <laughs> I think we can all probably sympathize with that. Scott, we're going to jump over to you for this one. What is the favorite, your favorite part of your job? My favorite part of the job is, is all the challenges that I face. Um, it's, you know, it's, it makes work exciting. Um, we can address different uh, challenges in our culture and beyond. And the ability to to discover things and to move things forward and to have an idea and to take it to uh, fruition is a really cool part of my job that I enjoy probably the most. We do write publications, so I'm an author and um, we publish papers and in, in journals that people can see worldwide. They're permanent, so long after I'm gone, my publications will still be there, which is kind of cool. Uh, but, th but those are really the main aspects of my job that I find uh, rewarding. Kimberly, how about you? Um, I just like the, the, the dynamics of a manufacturing environment as you never know what you're gonna face every day. So if you're a person who likes a uh, routine and likes knowing what they're doing from day to day, um, manufacturing isn't for you. So um, my, I love that something's new every day I get to do something new and also I like um, working with new customers with new product products so Leslie I love working with people and with uh, this job we get to work with communities firsthand so find out what their biggest problems are and then use our resources across the country to solve the problems for communities so I love doing that, getting out in the field, um, getting to actually be on site and see construction happening. Um, it's, it's, that's probably the most enjoyable part, actually, seeing your designs um, being constructed and then seeing them operational at the end of the project. Richie, tell us about your favorite part of your job. Working with our customers, uh, trying to get them, just working with them and then uh, uh, work get, get into a solution that helps them grow their businesses. Uh, but I, th I would say that the, the most satisfy satisfying thing is working with my employees uh, and helping develop them and coaching them to uh, grow into hopefully taking over my position one day. All right, Kimberly, we're going to turn to you for this one. When did you realize this was the career you wanted to pursue? Was there a particular event or a person that influenced your decision? Well, I can say my high school chemistry teacher was very influential in me um, deciding to go the chemical engineering route. Um, as a child, I always knew I wanted to 
do some type of engineering. I just didn't know which discipline. And when I was in my high school chemistry class, that's just what clicked for me. Um, and then um, while in college, I was able to do a summer internship with DuPont. And being in that environment and seeing what the engineers and operations did day to day kind of solidified, yes, this is, this is what I want to do as a career. Scott, how about you? I also had a biology, a high school biology uh, teacher that was very influential. And, um, and, over, and, and because of that fondness for biology, I've worked in the pharmaceutical field, I've done research and now uh, a scientist in that field as well. So I've been in that field in multiple areas, in this field from multiple areas over the years. And it's primarily because of the spark she uh, set off when I was in high school. Richie, how about you? I would say one of my teachers uh, in a CAD drawing back in the day when it was still very, very new uh, was someone that, somebody that really brought me to manufacturing to, the, to go down an engineering path. Uh, that, was the, the, that was probably the light bulb moment for me, knowing that I was going to be able to influence designs or changing the, 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 how somebody manufactured something. It really excited me. And Leslie, was there a particular event, a person that influenced your decision? I don't think it was a particular time um, that I realized I wanted to be an engineer, but I did love math and science in high school. So my parents suggested, hey, why don't you apply to school in the engineering program? It's probably easier to transfer out than to transfer in the program. So um, first year engineering programs are very general. So you get to experience all that's out there and then choose your focus in your sophomore or junior year. So um, I was very happy I chose to kind of take that risk and apply to college to engineering programs because um, I found I had a passion for water once I got to college. And we have, I believe, one more question before we start wrapping it up. What is the most important personality trait that an engineering uh, engineer should have? Scott, let's start with you. Well, I'm not an engineer, so. <laughs> but I, I would think, <laughs> that seeing my friends that went through engineering programs in, in college, that you have to be a hard worker. <laughs> they had projects that were day and night and would last like, you know, it would take seven days to do one single pro problem. Uh, my, my roommate was a... Uh, uh, a civil engineer. So they be, they design a bridge for uh, multiple days. Uh, but yeah, just my experience as a scientist, you know, we, you have to be curious and hardworking, um, you know, and, and also, also the soft skills. You have to show up to work every day on time. You have to have a great, great attitude, be willing to do uh, what what's expected of you and, um, and do whatever helps the company that you're working for the most. And then you'll be successful throughout your career. Richie, what, what most important personality trait would, do you think an engineering an engineer should have? An open mind. I mean, I think somebody that's very close-minded would not be a good fit as an engineer. You need to be open to adapt to a situation because things change. You know, it, it, I think every design is different. We all want to look at things in a set way but when it comes to you know designing things it, you know you need to sometimes be able to be a, a very open thinker and think outside the box. Kimberly? Um, I think that you a good trait to have is communication skills. Um, you have to be able to talk to people above and below you. You, be, you have to be able to communicate to your managers and upper level management the ideas and things that you want to incorporate and improve upon. And then you also be able, have to be able to communicate with um, operators and plant technicians on things as well and glean that knowledge. So um, communication is, is critical in order to be an effective engineer. And Leslie? I think just being curious and having a thirst to solve problems. Um, I think similar to what Richie said, you know, 
every situation is different and you have to look at things um, from different angles and just be open-minded to solve problems. Um, also just being detail-oriented. Um, some types of engineering, it, it could be life or death for people. If you're building a bridge or a building um, and also water, people are drinking water. So um, just making sure you're detail-oriented is um, very important to being an engineer. All right, well, I believe it is time to wrap up and turn this back over to Sherry. I do wanna take a, a minute to thank our panelists for coming on and answering our student questions. Um, the information you've provided has been very informative um, and interesting and um, just really appreciate your participation in the panel. I'm gonna turn it back over to Sherry. I believe she has one more poll for our students to complete. Sherry? Go ahead, Jessica, I think you have that. So I'll launch the poll. Um, rather than we've thrown a lot of questions at our panelists, so I'm going to turn things on our student attendees and we'll just ask um, if you had heard of any of the organizations that were on our panel today before today, and then what you were most surprised to learn from our panelists, what they do, where they work, or their kind of education and experience that has led them to their current um, jobs. So I'll give folks a few seconds so we get at least the majority of our attendees' uh, responses, and then I'll close the poll and we'll take a quick peek. Few more seconds. So it looks like a fairly pretty close to even mix of um, folks who had and had not heard of organizations. So definitely um, getting kind of new organizations, new companies out in front of students. And then we uh, this has been the trend. This is our last, well, my last panel of the day, and every panel has said that what folks were most um, surprised to learn about was our panelist experience. So thank you to our panelists for sharing that experience with our students. Sherry? Students, we hope you were exposed to some new careers and organizations in our region today. You can continue your career exploration through Major Clarity and the Career Choice website and activities. Remember, the more you engage, the more you earn. This panel counts as an activity towards career choice year, as do the other panels, the scavenger hunt and the surveys. Thank you to our moderator, panelists, teachers, and sponsors who made today's discussion possible. We couldn't bring career choice to our regional students without you. Here's hoping that we get to see you all, business students and teachers back in person next school year. Thank you.